72 tunnels, 851 kilometers underground, and a staggering 50 billion, this is what it takes to build a railway through the Himalayas. The Sichuan Tibet Railway is one of the most ambitious and controversial infrastructure projects of our time. The Himalayas have long been a natural barrier, but China's new railway project aims to change that. Today, we're taking a closer look at this 50 billion investment that's bridging gaps and raising questions. How will this massive project impact the region? Let's find out in this video. But before we dive into the details, make sure to subscribe and turn on notifications for future updates. The Sichuan-Tibet Railway is a 1,629-kilometer or 1,012-mile 1 long railway line being constructed in one of the most challenging terrains in the world. It will connect Chengdu, the capital of Sichuan province, to Lhasa, the capital of Tibet. To put that into perspective, that's roughly the distance from New York City to Miami. Currently, it takes about 48 hours to travel from Chengdu to Lhasa, but once this railway is completed, that journey will be cut down to just 13 hours. This project is being built in segments, some of which are already operational. The first segment, from Chengdu to Ya'an, opened on December 28, 2018. Then, on June 25, 2021, the Ningqi Lhasa segment began operations. This segment is notable as the first electrified railway in Tibet and the first high-speed rail on the Tibetan Plateau. The final and most challenging segment, from Ya'an to Ningqi, is expected to be completed around 2030. While that might seem like a long time, considering the challenges involved, it's actually quite impressive. This isn't just any railway, it's a high elevation railway that will traverse the Tibetan Plateau, often called the Roof of the World. We're talking about building tracks at altitudes where the air is so thin you'd be gasping for breath just standing still. Special trains called China Railway CR200J Fuxing Series train sets run on this line. These trains are specially designed to handle the high altitudes and challenging conditions of the Tibetan Plateau. They're equipped with both diffusion and distributed oxygen systems to help passengers cope with altitude sickness. Let's talk about the elevation for a moment. This railway has to deal with an elevation difference of 3,000 meters, nearly 10,000 feet. The starting point in the Sichuan Basin is only about 300 meters above sea level, but by the time you reach Lhasa, you're at 3,000 meters. In fact, 90% of the railway runs at an altitude of more than 3,000 meters. Some sections of the track will even be built at elevations higher than the summit of Mont Blanc, the highest peak in Western Europe. To give you an idea of the scale of this project, the railway will include 72 tunnels with a total length of 851 kilometers, 528 miles. That's more than half of the entire railway line. The longest of these is the Yangling Tunnel, stretching an incredible 42.5 kilometers, 26 miles. To put that into perspective, it's longer than the Channel Tunnel connecting England and France, which is considered one of the seven wonders of the modern world. The Nyingchi segment alone required the construction of 47 tunnels and 121 bridges, crossing the Yarlung Tsangpo River Valley 16 times. But it's not just the altitude that's a challenge. Engineers are also dealing with extreme temperatures and permafrost. Imagine trying to build a stable railway line on ground that's frozen most of the year, but turns to mush during the brief summer. It's like trying to build a sandcastle on a beach as the tide comes in only much, much harder. Temperature variations in this region can be extreme, ranging from scorching heat in the summer to bitter cold in the winter. Engineers have to design tracks and structures that can withstand these massive temperature swings without warping or cracking. And let's not forget about the seismic activity in the region. The Himalayas are a geologically active area prone to earthquakes. Building a railway that can withstand potential tremors adds another layer of complexity to an already challenging project. Engineers are using cutting-edge technology and innovative design solutions to ensure the railway can handle whatever nature throws at it. For example, the Mila Mountain Tunnel, which is 10 kilometers long, lies 1,200 meters below a mountain range and has an average altitude of 3,100 meters above sea level. A one-of-a-kind, world's largest and most powerful tunnel boring machine designed specifically for this project is being used. But why go through all this trouble? Well, the potential economic benefits are enormous. This railway is set to be a game-changer for Tibet's economy, potentially transforming one of China's least developed regions into a bustling hub of activity. 
it's going to dramatically improve connectivity between Tibet and central and eastern China. This means faster and cheaper transportation of goods, which could lead to a boom in trade. Tourism is another big factor. Tibet is already a popular destination for its breathtaking landscapes and unique culture. With easier access, we could see a surge in tourism, bringing more money to local communities. We're talking about potentially millions of new visitors each year, which could lead to a boom in the hospitality industry, creating jobs in hotels, restaurants, and tour companies. The railway could also open up access to Tibet's mineral resources. The region is rich in copper, iron, and rare earth elements, which are crucial for many modern technologies. These minerals are essential for everything from electric car batteries to wind turbines. Easier transportation could make mining these resources more economically viable, potentially turning Tibet into a key player in the global supply chain. For these critical materials, all of this could lead to a major boost in Tibet's GDP and living standards. The Chinese government has stressed that this project is part of its efforts to reduce poverty in the region. They hope that better infrastructure will attract more investment, create jobs, and ultimately improve the quality of life for Tibetans. Some economists predict that the railway could help double Tibet's GDP in the next few decades. That's a massive shift for a region that has long been one of China's poorest. But wait! Before we get too excited about these potential economic benefits, we need to address the serious environmental concerns surrounding this project, which have raised alarms among environmentalists and local communities. Tibet's ecosystem is incredibly delicate. It's often called the third pole because it holds the largest reserve of fresh water outside the polar regions. The area is home to unique species like the snow leopard, the Tibetan antelope, and the black-necked crane. Many of these species are already endangered, and the construction of the railway, along with the increased human activity it will bring, could disrupt wildlife habitats and migratory routes. There's also the issue of pollution. More tourists mean more waste, and in a region with limited waste management infrastructure, this could become a major problem. We've seen this happen in other popular tourist destinations, beautiful natural areas littered with plastic bottles and trash. And let's not forget about the carbon emissions from the trains and the increased industrial activity. While trains are generally more eco-friendly than cars or planes, they still produce emissions, especially if they're not powered by clean energy sources. The construction process itself is another concern. Building tunnels and bridges in this pristine environment could lead to habitat destruction and increased erosion. There's also the risk of contaminating local water sources, which could have devastating effects on both wildlife and human communities that rely on these resources. The Chinese government has promised to implement strict environmental protection measures, but many environmentalists remain skeptical. It's a classic case of development versus conservation, and finding the right balance won't be easy. Some argue that the economic benefits outweigh the environmental costs, while others believe preserving Tibet's unique ecosystem should be the top priority. What do you think? Is it possible to achieve both development and environmental protection, or do we always have to choose one over the other? Now let's talk about the people. The social and cultural impact of this railway could be profound. Tibet has a unique culture that has developed over thousands of years in relative isolation. The railway could change that dramatically, and not everyone is happy about it. On one hand, improved connectivity could bring better access to education and health care for Tibetans. Students might find it easier to attend universities in other parts of China, broadening their horizons and opportunities. Patients could more easily reach specialized medical facilities, potentially saving lives. This could be especially important for people in remote areas who currently have limited access to these services. But on the other hand, there are concerns about what some call the sinicization of Tibet. The railway could lead to an increased influx of Han Chinese migrants and tourists, potentially overwhelming the local Tibetan population. Some worry this could dilute Tibetan culture and way of life. Another aspect to consider is the potential for economic disparities. While the railway could bring economic opportunities, there's a risk that many of the benefits might go to newcomers or big corporations instead of local Tibetans. This has occurred in other fast-growing regions where locals often feel left behind by rapid development. Now let's step back and look at the bigger picture. This railway isn't just about economics or culture, it's also about geopolitics. And trust me, it's as complex as a game of three-dimensional chess. For China, the railway holds massive strategic value. It will give Beijing much stronger control over Tibet, 
a region that has experienced tensions and unrest in the past. The railway will enable quicker deployment of security forces if necessary. However, China's neighbors, especially India, are wary of this project. India and China have long-standing border disputes in the Himalayas, and India fears the railway could give China a military edge in the region. There's also the question of how this railway might shift the balance of power in the broader area. Could it be used to expand China's influence deeper into South Asia? Some experts believe it could tie into China's larger Belt and Road Initiative, which aims to build a modern Silk Road linking Asia, Europe, and Africa. And let's not overlook the potential impact on global trade routes. If this railway eventually connects to networks in other countries, it could reshape international trade patterns. Goods that currently move by sea might start traveling overland, potentially bypassing key maritime choke points like the Strait of Malacca. So what do Tibetans think about all this? Well, it's complicated, opinions are mixed, and it's worth noting that getting a clear picture can be challenging due to restrictions on free speech in the region. Some Tibetans are hopeful about the economic opportunities the railway might bring. Others are more cautious, concerned about losing their land and resources to outside interests. The Chinese government is fully committed to this project. They highlight its potential for development and poverty reduction, arguing that the railway will bring economic growth to one of China's most impoverished regions. They cite the success of the Qinghai Tibet Railway, completed in 2006, as proof that such infrastructure projects can significantly boost local economies. Additionally, they emphasize their commitment to addressing environmental concerns, promising strict protective measures. These include wildlife corridors to allow animals to safely cross the tracks and strategies to prevent permafrost degradation. However, as previously discussed, many environmentalists remain doubtful about how effective these measures will be. Of course, Beijing also stresses the strategic importance of the project for national integration. From their perspective, improving connectivity between Tibet and the rest of China is essential for maintaining stability and unity. They view infrastructure development as a critical tool for nation building. The government also takes pride in the engineering challenges involved, seeing the railway as a testament to China's advancing technological capabilities. Neighboring countries are closely monitoring the geopolitical implications. As mentioned earlier, India is particularly wary of the military aspects. Other regional nations are also paying attention, curious about how this project might alter the balance of power in the area. So, what does the future hold for the Sichuan-Tibet Railway? If everything goes as planned, by 2030, we could see trains speeding across the Tibetan plateau at speeds that would have been unimaginable just a few decades ago. There's potential for further expansion of Tibet's railway network, reaching more remote areas and possibly even extending into neighboring countries. However, the challenges won't disappear once construction is complete. Maintaining a high-altitude railway in such extreme conditions will be an ongoing struggle against nature. The freezing temperatures, thin air, and unstable terrain will continue to pose difficulties long after the first trains begin operating. As we've seen, the Sichuan-Tibet Railway is far more than just a transportation project. It's a complex mix of economic, environmental, cultural, and geopolitical issues. It raises significant questions that demand careful consideration. Ultimately, the success of this project will hinge on how well these competing interests can be balanced. Can the economic benefits be achieved without harming the environment or Tibetan culture? Can regional tensions be managed effectively? Only time will tell. One thing is certain. The Sichuan-Tibet Railway will shape the future of Tibet, China, and the entire Himalayan region for decades to come. It's a story we'll be following closely in the years ahead. That's it for today's video. As always, thanks for watching.